Welcome to lecture one. Uh, we'll be going through an introduction to objects and variables. <clears throat> so before we talk about um, variables, before we talk, okay, this let me let me see. Let's start with um, let's start with variables. Then we're gonna touch a bit on objects. Um, so let me open Notepad. Okay, so so yeah, this this variables are are a type of an identifier. So what is an identifier? An identifier is a name that is used to identify a class, method, or variable. Right. So it's just a name for you or a label that you use to identify, OK, this is a class, OK, this is a method, and then this is a variable. And then the rules for create creating a, for the rules for creating an identifier, right? These are the rules. So what are the rules to name or to, to name a class or method or variable or to come up with an identifier? So let's see. Um, Identifiers, um, they need to start with an underscore. You can start with an underscore or the dollar sign and um, a let an, uh, an alphabet. Let me say an alphabet. Yeah, that's 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 this is one of the rules of creating an identifier. It has to start with an underscore or a, a dollar sign or an alphabet. An identifier cannot, and I'm going to write it in uppercase, cannot start with a digit. You can't create an identifier and then you start with the digit. You cannot do that. Because now it, it becomes it becomes ambiguous. It becomes yeah, it, 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 it's unclear or to the computer what is really going on. So let's say, for example, you had you created an identifier and you want to call it um, five times. So now the computer gets confused, like, OK, do you mean the five times times or what? Or it's just five times, like, what do you mean? So you can create an identifier and then it begins or it starts with the digit. You cannot do that. And then in Java, it's specifically in Java, each programming language has its own has its own sort of like um, rules that you have to follow. It's not it's not necessarily rules. It's like um, it's not necessarily rules, but it's like it's like it's sort of like um, it's like it, it gives you options like, OK, if you had done it this way, then it will be it'll be way easier to understand. So it's not it's not it's not necessarily rules, but then it's like tips or. Better ways to do things. Each programming language is there's those set of standards that you have to meet. So let's let's talk about um, the camel case, right? So when you create an identifier, you have to create it using camel case. So you use camel case. So why is it called camel case? Um, it's called camel case because if you look at it, if you look at an example of an identifier, it looks like a, like a camel's humps. So what do I mean by that? So let's um, let me see. Let me open draw.io. So this is an example of a chemical. So it's like this. So chemical case meaning that um, the the meaning that the the letter of the first the, the first letter of the identifier, right? It needs to be a small letter, or it needs to be in lowercase. And then the first letter of each subsequent word. So each letter, each the first, let me say um, the first letter of each 
subsequent subsequent word should be uppercase. What does that mean? Let's make an example. Uh, for example, let's say I want to create a an identifier called um, what should I call it? Um, <clears throat> number of apples, right? So this is how I would use camel case to create a, a an identifier called number of apples. So how would I do it? Remember the first the, the letter of the first word. The, the first letter of the first word, it should be a lowercase. So if I'm writing number, I'm going to say number like this. And this, that's the first letter or the first character of the first word. It should be small letters. And then each the first letter of each subsequent word or each word that comes after. That's what subsequent means. It means each word that comes after. The, it's first the 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 the, the, the ca you should capitalize its first the its first letter or its first character. Let me say first character. If I say letter, I don't know. It sounds weird. So you should capital the first character of each subsequent word should be an uppercase. So number of so that means remember. Um, okay, another tip is another rule for creating an identifier no spaces between the words so there shouldn't be any spaces <clears throat> so you can say number like this and then you put a space <clears throat> and then you, you write the next word and then you put a space and then you say apples you can't do that it has to be combined it has to be one thing so instead of this you're going to have to make it like number of apples like this. So it has to be number of apples like this. So this is how camel case looks. As you can see, the 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 the, the, the first character of the first word of the first word is a lowercase. In this case, it's n. It's a small n. It's a lowercase n. And then the first character of each subsequent word is an uppercase. So how how do I distinguish between the words? You know words, right? So number, it's a word. And then of is also its own word. So as you can see, the first character of, of each of the words that follow is in, is in uppercase. So look at this first character, it's a capital O. Look at A, it's a capital A. And remember, there's no spaces in between the identifiers. So we have that camel case, and then it can be the identifier can be of any length. It can be it can be as long as you want it to be. It can be of any length. There's no specific restrictions or limitations. It doesn't really matter. But make sure it's not really too long. Like some some identifiers won't make sense because you're gonna have to. Remember that identifiers, we can view them similarly to, to, to variables in math. If you remember your, your, your math class, um, you would have, for example, x is equals to 3, and then now they say y is equals to x plus 2. So how do I find y? I replace x with its value, which is 3, plus 2, and then I find out that y is now 5. So in this case, x is an identifier. y is an identifier. It's a name that's used to identify something, right? In this case, it's identifying a value, which is 3. And then y is identifying the final answer or formula, this formula. It's meant to, it's used to, it's a label used to identify that formula. So identifiers is exactly the same as ver as variables in math, right? So obviously you don't want it to be too long. So for example, imagine you have this this identifier or this variable. This is a very long variable name. Imagine now you have to reference this every time. So imagine now you have to say is equals to 
10, right? And then now find y. So y is equals to that very long name plus 10. You see, it really makes no sense. There's there's no reason why you should be creating an identifier with the name that's so long. Look at how long this name is. So now when you every time you have to call it or use it, yeah, it becomes it becomes untidy. So just avoid making it too long. And make sure you to, to make your code in the future to make your programs easier to read. You need to make sure you, you the the identifiers that you that the identifiers that you that you create or the, the names that you give for your class methods or variables. You should make sense. Instead of saying num of s or num of students, you shouldn't, instead of doing that, instead you should do it like this. You should write it in full. Number of students. So that when the next person looks at your code, it's going to be like, oh, okay, they're talking about number of students. Num could be anything. So make sure that it's clear. There's no ambiguity in, in your in your naming, in your code. Make it very easier for the next person. Make the next person's life easier. So that's those are identifiers, right? So now let's talk about rules for creating an identifier for a class, a method, and a variable. So rules. Let's let's start with rules for creating an identifier identifier for a class, right? So to create an identifier for a class, you would have to, you still use camel case, right? Still use camel case like this, but then the only difference is that, the only difference is that the first letter now becomes uppercase. So that means the first character of each word should be uppercase. So first character, of each word is in uppercase. So for example, so for example, we have um let's say um let me see, let's say this is my digit, right? Or oh, this is yeah, this let's come up with the with the okay, let's call it hello, let's call it hello world, right? Is I'm creating a class called Hello World. So that means if I'm writing Hello World, this is Hello World, right? Remember that there's no spaces. The same rules that I that we had written here, they also apply here with classes. So no spaces between the words. And then remember what the rule states. The first character of each word is an uppercase. So H, that's the first character. So I'm going to make it an uppercase. And then world, it's a, it's another world, it's another word. So the, the what, what's the first character? It's W. Then I'm gonna change that to an uppercase. So now this is how you would name a class. Each first, the first character of each word is in uppercase, as you can see. So that's that's just the, the simple rule for naming a class. That's the only thing you have to remember for classes. On top of this on top of this information that I've stated here. And then rules for variables. OK, rules for variables and methods, right? A method and a variable. A method, just think of it, think of it as a function, just like in math, when you'd have f of x is equals to this and that, that function, whatever. It's the same thing. They're talking about functions. This is a, a method is a function. And then a variable is just variables like x is equals to this. And then y is equals to x plus 4. Therefore, I would know that y should be 9, right? How do I get 9? Remember that x is a placeholder. It's a variable or in other terms, a placeholder. It, it, it holds, it holds, it becomes a placeholder for 5. So every time I call x, 
I'm, I'm actually calling five. So that means I'm going to need to replace X with its actual value, which is five plus four, which gives me nine, right? So those, these are variables. This is what we call variables. You've been using them your entire life. So we have a bit of an understanding of, bit of generic understanding of identifiers, right? Variables, this and that, right? So now let's talk about class. What is a class? What is an object? So a class in simple terms is a plan or a blueprint. You can say a plan or a blueprint or a template. So that's you can, it's, you, can it's, you can also use that word. So a class is a plan or blueprint to build some something, right? And the something that we're building is what we call an object. So an object would say is the thing that is built based on the plan, right? So it's like, in simple terms, a class is like a blueprint, right? So it's imagine you have a plan to build a house, right? So we'd call the plan, we'll call that a class. That's the plan. That's the blueprint. That's how you, you structure how the house would look, the, 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 the dimensions and everything. That's the plan. And then the object is the house that has been built now. So that's why I said the, an object is the thing that is built based on the plan. You cannot build that object based on something else. You can't make a plan and then build the house not based on the plan. Obvious, you made a plan to build the house, right? So you need to follow that, follow through that that plan. So that's why we have um, architects that are going to plan, and then we have uh, builders that are going to build the object. So that's what Java. That's what Java is all about. It views, um, it, it looks at everything that you write in terms of objects. So it looks at it in terms of objects interacting with each other. They're communicating with each other. For example, um, you can say, let's say a, a person eats, um, a person eats an apple, right? Person is an object, right? Also apple, is an object. So therefore, person is communicating with an apple, right? And what 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 did we say an apple is? Is an a person is we said it's an object. So object. What did you say an apple is? We said an apple is an object. So basically an object is communicating with an object. So that's how it views, or that, that's the concept that it applied, it, 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 it applies or it works with. It looks, it, it looks, it, it remember computers, what, the, what, their, what their main goal was, was to like sort of like extend our, in a way I'd say consciousness, in a way you can say that, but it's like to help us evolve as human beings, right? There's certain things that we are limited in doing. But then remember, since its main goal is to help us evolve, that means it mimics what we do. It mimics the, the world we live in. I am a person, I'm also an object. I can be referred to as an object. If I'm drinking water from a water bottle, I'm a person, the water bottle is, an, is also, I'm, I'm, I'm a person, so I'm an object. The water bottle is also an object, so therefore an object is communicating with an object. So it mimicked the world we live in. It views things in terms of objects communicating with objects. So that's why every single thing that you write in Java, it has to be within a class. There's no exception. There has to be a plan because it views every, everything that you write as objects communicating with each other. So make sure that when you, you, when you start coding, you're gonna see, when you start using an IDE, this IDE here. So 
yeah, I will get to IDE, not just, not yet. We want to get there and explain what an IDE is. I think I did explain it in the previous video, but yeah, we'll just recap. So this is Java. It views everything as objects communicating with objects, right? So, so how would you, what's the syntax now? We understand what a class is when you understand what an, what an object is. What is the syntax? So this is the syntax. You say public class followed by the name. Remember, remember what we talked about, the rules of naming a class? The first character of each word needs to be in uppercase. So if I want to create a house, a plan for a house, I'll call it house. So you always start with these two keywords public and class, and then followed by the name of the object, right? Or yeah, what's the type of object that you want to build? But we can just say it's a name of it's the name of the of the object. So this is, and then you put um Kelly braces, this brackets here. What what this Kelly braces signify or denote is that everything is packaged within this house. Just like you are an object, everything is, people are objects, everything is packaged within us, right? Your organs are, your organs and everything is within you, right? So that's, in a, in, that in, in a sense, that's what it's trying to accomplish. It's trying to tell you that, oh, okay, this is packaged. It's like, in a way, it's like we're putting a box and then giving it a label house. Everything is packaged within that box. Everything goes within that block, that box. The moment you write anything after this Kelly braces or this, this Kelly bracket, it becomes, it, it doesn't become part of the blueprint anymore because it's now, it now exceeds, it now extends out, outwards, right? It's on the outside now. It's no longer within that box. So we know what class is. We've defined it there as a blueprint. So when you see this class keyword, it's like, oh, okay, you you mean you want to you want to build a plan for your, for for something? Then he knows, oh, okay, he's building a plan, and then no, you need to give it a name. Oh, so you're building a plan for a house. Now the computer knows, oh, you're building a plan for a house because you gave it a name. And then uh, we also have this keyword public. What does public mean? Public it means, in simple terms, everyone. Not necessarily, okay, everyone has access to it. Yeah, let me just, yeah, everyone has access to it. For example, TXC, it's public transport, right? Why is it called public transport? It, it's called public transport because it's transport for the public. So the same applies here. This class is for the public, it's for the people. It means anyone, and everyone has access to this plan, right? So, yeah, and pay attention to the rules. Please pay attention to the rules. The spaces in between, there's one space between everything. Public is its own keyword, class is its own keyword, and then this is its own thing. And then you also need to put a space after there. And, the way you structure Kelly braces is also, is also important. I know some of you want to structure it like this. This is wrong. It's, it, your, co your computer won't complain, but this is not Java code. This is not what we call Java code. When, when senior developers or when senior developers or other people who, who have senior positions, when they look at your code, they're going to look at it in disgust because they expect you to read documentation and understand the language in the ins and outs of an of a language. So we typically structure it like this. You always write it like this. The the opening Kelly brace is, is, is there at the top. And then in the next line, that's when you put the closing Kelly braces. So there's the, this is how the, every single, and then, now you're going to ask yourself, um, how am I going to write this code? How am I going to write all of these statements? So the way you're going to write it is 
you can write it in 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 something inside something that we call a text editor, right? Or an IDE. Let's just talk about an an IDE or text edit. So a text editor, right? It means in simple terms, it's self-explanatory. It means I am editing text, right? And that's what a text editor does. So you can write this and run your code inside using a text editor. You can write the code inside a text editor. You can write the code inside a text editor and then run it maybe via the console or the terminal or the command line or, or however you want to call it. So we have that. That's the first tool you can use. Or, or we can also use an IDE an integrated development environment. So the nice thing about the integrated development environment, right? It has a lot of benefits. You can you can have it also has auto complete. Whenever you're typing something, let's say for example, I'm I want to type public, right? And I just type pub, and then l it I can pre I can press auto complete and then it fills in the remaining keywords or the remaining let characters. So it also it has auto complete, and it also has what we call a compiler. Remember what we talked about in the first previous video. The programming language is sort of like um, a trade-off between the the, the trade-off that or the agreement that the computer and the 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 the, the, the computer the the, the, the it's a sort of like a, the middle man or the middle language that took some parts of the machine language and some parts of the human language. Remember that English is not a really good language for us to use because there's uh, there's we we have what we call synonyms and things like that. We also have one word that can mean ten different things, so it becomes ambiguous when you're writing statements using that um, using that language. So what I what 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 happened is that developers had to come up with they had to come up with a way to or come up with a language that doesn't have those um, inconsistencies so or those negative traits. So, so with, with the programming with the programming language, right? It, it doesn't have all those issues. There's nothing ambiguous about programming language. It if one keyword means one, one each keyword means one thing. So that's the nice, that's the beauty of it. So we have since they had to come up with a language. Remember the language is in between the machine language and also in between our language English, the most commonly used language English, right? So that means it's not really machine language and it's also not really English. So we have to translate. Some translation is to go into place. So what the compiler does, it, it serves as a translator. To translate um, this, these statements that you're going to write like this into the language that the computer can understand to its native language, to its home language. You are trans the compiler translates the language to, to the computer's home language so that the computer understands the task that you've asked it to do. So we have that compiler there. We have autocomplete. So yeah, it comes very, yeah, these are, there's many more benefits to this. We also have, um, Syntax highlighting. So what is syntax highlighting? So it 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 uses a specific color for keywords that Java knows or uh, recognize Java keyword. So for example, public and class, they would be highlighted. So let's just demonstrate this inside here. Uh, Uh, why isn't it doing this? Okay, it's fine. Let's while it's 
loading or whatever. Let's let's um let's open. Yeah, okay. I already had this program here. This is from a previous video. So yeah, as I was saying, uh, the syntax highlighting. You see that blue, that blue there. It means oh, this is a reserved Java keyword. It's part of the language. This is what I came up with. This is mine. This is what I own. This is owned by Java or by the developers of Java. It's part of Java. It comes with Java. So it highlights that so that you are aware of what is reserved and what's not reserved, right? So that's what I was talking about. It, it also has syntax highlighting. So it has syntax highlighting. Uh, we have all of these things. That's and also to complete. So IDE is quite useful. So yeah, we're gonna start with the text editor, right? Text editor. Then we then we're gonna use an IDE. That is all these things. It's the IDE makes your life life easier, but you can't we can't make your life easier and you don't know what's bad about it. <laughs> so we're gonna show you the 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 annoying part of having to use a text edit. And um, yeah, there's also, it also formats, um, formats your code. So it formats your code according to how it's supposed to be formatted. With the text edit, it doesn't. So for example, if I just write this main like this, you see, I would have to format it myself. I would have to add the spaces where in the the spaces in the nest the spaces in the necessary places. So I would have to add a space there. All those things. So yeah, it becomes a lot with the text editor. It becomes too demanding. But we, we're gonna we're gonna see we're gonna, we actually we're actually gonna see the problem with that. So we have class. We have public class house. Okay. This is, a, this is the plan. So now um, we've talked about editors and whatnot. So let's talk about objects, right? Remember, we've been talking about classes. Now let's talk about an object. How would you create an object if this is the plan? It's simple. You would start with the name of the object or what type of an object it is. So it's a house. OK, let's, let's look at the uh, syntax, right? Uh, syntax for declaring. Declaring just means you're making that thing available. Just like me saying X is equals to 10 like this. I'm declaring X. I'm making X available. That's what declaring means. So I'm, I'm making it available for use so that I can use it later. So how would it declare a, how would you declare Let's say let, let's talk about syntax of declaring a variable, right? How would you declare a variable? You start by writing a data type, and then you put a space. Remember the space is very important. Let, let's let me show you what I mean about the space. If I remove the space between these two, you see the problem. It becomes all black. It doesn't it, it does not recognize now what you're talking about because there's no such thing as public. Uh, public C C L A S S keyword in Java, but if you put the space where you're supposed to put the space, it highlights like, oh, okay, I know what public means, I know what class means. So spacing is very important. So you're gonna have data type, and then you put a space, and then followed by the name of the variable, and then followed by a semicolon. So the name of the variable, we can also say this is this basically means um, let me think what what's, what's another. Mm, let's just say the placeholder. So yeah, that's. Yeah, just the, the name of the variable just means it, it's the placeholder, it's the label. It's the placeholder or label that you want to use. That's that's what name of variable means. Uh, remember brackets. Don't forget your English classes. Brackets. The the purpose of brackets is to provide or to add extra information or extra explanation for whatever thing you have been. 
So don't try to declare and write it like this. Don't do that. Remember your English class. Remember what brackets are for. I'm just adding brackets so that I explain what I mean by this, by name of variable. Name of variable, it means that it's a placeholder or label, the label that I want to use. So what is what is data type? Data type in, is just, it is a keyword that tells the computer what type of data will this label, this label or variable will store. That's what data type means. It's just a keyword. Remember, um, computers are unlike us, right? They're unlike human beings. You'd have to be explicit. Like you have to, you have to be very direct. Don't leave the computer to, to, to fill in the blanks, to, to autocomplete, to, to use intuition. That's not how the computer works. So, for example, if you wanted to give instructions to someone to send to send someone to go to go um, make up, right? It's simple. You'd say go mix up one command done. And then they, maybe they might ask uh, what me what what meat should I make? Should I make um rolls or chicken or beef? Then you'd be like, oh, just make beef stew done. Then that person would go to the kitchen and then cook, use all the right ingredients, salt and everything. The way a computer is, it's like a newborn baby. It, is, it has potential to be very intelligent, but it's also stu stu stupid at the same time. You'd have to be very explicit. You'd have to be very, very explicit. And you, so how would you direct a computer to go to go make a meal? You have to be very direct, very explicit. How would you do that? You you write it in steps. Step one, you tell it go to the kitchen, and then step two, you'd say after going to the kitchen, right? What should you do? Step two, tell it to open the fridge, and then step three, take. Take take out beef from the fridge, and then step four. Don't forget to tell it to close the fridge. That's that's how demanding a computer is. You have to be very direct, like step by step. Don't skip any steps. If you don't tell it to close the fridge, what's going to happen? It's just going to follow your instruction. You'll be like, oh, okay. There's no instruction for close the fridge. So it's just going to skip. It's going to leave the fridge open. And then it becomes a problem. So that's what I mean when I say the computer is, is a baby. It's very intelligent. There's potential for it to become very intelligent, but you also need to be very explicit and tell, tell it exactly what to do. It's not going to infer. But it's not going to infer um, from what you've said and say, OK, oh, so this is what they mean. I must do this. I must firstly go. Oh, I'm saying go to the chicken. <laughs> I'm saying go to the kitchen. My bad. It rhymes though, kitchen, chicken. <laughs> it's sort of like a rhythm to it. But yeah, go to the kitchen, open the fridge, take out beef from the fridge, close the fridge, and then then you can say maybe maybe the pots are dead. You can say wash the pots maybe and then step six then you can say um wash the pods then you can say put beef into the pot into the pot put put the beef into the pot and then step seven put water or pour let me not say put uh is it poor? I forgot the spelling. I hope that's correct. <laughs> pour water into the pot. And then step eight, put the, you can say put 
salt into the pot and you, you, you also need to provide measurements. Also provide measurements of like maybe one one tablespoon or one teaspoon. Give it a measurement or else it's going to put the whole salt as it is unopened if it's unopened into the pot. So you have to be very explicit every single step. You have to tell it what to do. So that's a computer. So that's why we need things like data type. You can you can be able to tell you can if I say X is equals to 10, you can tell, oh, OK, this is a whole number. Well, the computer doesn't know that. So you have to be explicit. You have to use a data type. So if I wanted to say, I want if I wanted to write something equivalent to this in Java, how would I do it? Remember the syntax is without the brackets. This is a syntax. Data type, name of variable, semicolon. So what's the data type? I know it's a whole number, so I know it's, it's going to be an integer, right? So what's the keyword to for representing integers in Java? It's just an abbreviation of integer in all small letters, int. And then followed by space and the name of the variable, we're going to call it x, right? Semicolon. The way Java also operates, it, you need to also tell it that you are done with what you're with, with what you're doing, right? So that's what the semicolon means. It means okay, I'm done. I'm done creating a label. I'm done creating a variable. So end there. That's why that's this is where it ends. If you don't do that, if you just leave it like this, it's just gonna keep reading everything going down. So a semicolon is equivalent to a semicolon is equivalent to a full stop in English. If you know what a full stop does, that's what the semicolon does too. It means the exact same thing. It means, okay, full stop, it ends there. This is a new statement or this is a new sentence. So that's what that's how it views it. So this is this would be one sentence. But then we, in in coding, we don't call it a sentence. We call it a statement. It's not a sentence. It's called a statement. It, 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 it's the same thing, but you, you need to use the right terminology. You need to use the right words. Statement in this scenario. So this is going to be a statement. So now we know how to declare or how to create a variable, right? So how would we create a? So how would you create an object, right? OK, let me just put this down. How would you create a, an object? An object follows the same rules as a variable. You say data type and then name of variable, semicolon to terminate and say, OK, I'm done declaring it. So how do you do that? So you're going to say house. Whenever you create a, a class, use it, when you have, whenever you use the class keyword, right? In a way, you are defining your own data type or you're creating your own data type. Remember, this is a plan that you're making, right? So you are creating something, uh, creating a new data type. So you're going to use the name of that plan as a data type. Because now, now you've made a plan for that specific thing. You've made a plan for a house. So it can be used technically as a data type to define an object, right? So what's going to be the name of the object? I'm going to give it a name. Let's just say this is house number one. Imagine we had, imagine you had to build a plan for, you have to make six of the same houses. Obviously you make one plan, right? So that means if I wanted, if I wanted six houses, right? I'd have to do it like this. And then, four five six so this would be six houses so this this when it's written like this right it's no longer called it's no longer a variable right it's not a variable anymore it's now what we called an object so it's 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 the, it's the thing itself now if i said i'm gonna build a house this is the house now that i've that i said i was gonna build i've built the house now 
This is house number one. It's built. It's done. This is house number two. It's built. It's done. This is house number three. It's built. It's done and so forth. So that's that's how you that's how you'd create an object. So we know how to create an object now and you know what it you know what class is, you know what a pod public means. We know everything. So now we can get we can get started into yeah, we can now start coding right now. We can start. Let me see. Why is my VS code? How do I turn off this thing? Mm. Okay, let me just use let's let's just use this thing, man. Let's use Let's use, let's use Notepad++. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to save. Let me see, I'm going to save. Okay, let me, it doesn't want to, let me do this. We'll, we'll go into objects a bit deeper later on. For now, we're just going to touch the surface for now. So let's say you wanted to create a, Let's say I wanted to create a what is this? Um, I wanted to create a Java application, right? You'd have to create, you have to save it in a file, right? So I have to say new and then create a file. So I'm gonna create a a, a document, a, a a text document, right? So I'm gonna give it a name. So I'm gonna call it hello world. Mind you, pay attention, no spaces. And then instead of .txt, I'm going to save it as .java. What this does, it tells the computer, oh, I'm going to write Java code. So that's what it means. And then I'm going to open it with uh, Notepad++, right? So now we can start writing our code. So the way you've named your file, right? You see, it's hello world. Pay attention, pay attention to how I've named it. It's hello world, and uh, the 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 character the first character of each word is an uppercase. You remember what we talked about when we talked about this root? It was applied to classes. And remember what I said: everything that you write in Java it has to be it has to be within a class. So I'm gonna say public class hello world space this like this and then we also have i forgot to talk about some important keywords let's talk about them briefly so let's talk about static void yes let's talk about static and void so static let me see mm, should i talk about it now or a bit later Mm. Okay, static. Okay, let's talk about it now. Static, you can view it as um. You can say, let me see. You can say um, static is. Let's say something that is shared. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's something that is shared. Static, that means some that thing is being shared, right? And then we have void. Void is a data type. But is a data type that mean that means um nothing nothing was pretend. If you if you know um if you know if you know whenever you go to pick and pay and you're shopping and they call prudence. They're like prudence. Um, yeah, decline. It's declining. Void. Void. This is what they're talking about. They're like void. That means nothing was returned. The 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 person tried to pay, but they not they didn't get anything. So nothing was returned. They didn't get anything. 
that's what void means. It's it's also a data type. It means that, remember data type, it means that you're getting back something or you're storing a value, right? But then void, what void means, it's like nothing is being stored. That's like, that's what void means. So keep that in mind. So static is something that is shared, shared in the sense that, for example, you guys have, you have, you have the same goal. Let's say you have the same goal, right? Or let's say, you, let's say you have a twin, right? So you are twins, you have the same body, same height, same weight, same face, same everything, right? So, so obviously, if you are wise, to, in order to save money, you might buy one pair of clothes, right? And, and then just share, you could do that. Like why is in the sense that, for example, you wanted to buy the same clothes, right? I wanted to buy the same um, hoodie and you, my twin, my twin, um, my twin brother or twin sister wanted to also buy a hoodie and we wanted to buy the exact same hood. Remember, we are twins. We are the same. So instead of us spending money separately to buy the same thing, we use one of our money to buy that same hoodie and then we just share the hoodie. We just take turns. We're just sharing the hood. So we've saved a lot of money. And then the money that we've saved, we can just maybe go 50 50. I take 50%, he or she takes 50%, and then we go spoil ourselves. So we've saved money. You can view it in that way. You are just sharing instead of instead of reusing the same thing over and like instead of um, buying the same thing you just decide to buy one thing and then you guys share that one thing. That's what static means. So yeah, we, we know what static means now. So now when I write code, you, everything, everything, most of the things that I'm gonna write, they're gonna make sense. So we have public and then static, void, main. And then we're gonna have string. Args, right? So remember, string is also a data type. And then these brackets, right? These brackets. It means that it's a container. It's it's a list of values. It's like a vector. It's a it's like a one-dimensional vector of of values, right? What type of values do I have? I look at the data type because the data type tells me what type of data I have. So this is going to be a vector of strings, or we can call it an array of strings or a list of strings. That's how it's, that's what that's what that means. And then this is just the name of the variable. This that's the label or the name of a variable, however you want to call it. So let's talk about data types, right? So the data types that we have, we have byte. And pay attention when I write it, it highlights to 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 tell me or to notify me. Oh, okay, this is um this is a reserved in it's this is a reserved keyword in Java. Then we have short, then we have int, then we have long, then we have float, then we have double, and then we have string. String, we're not going to talk about it now. It's a very complicated topic. It needs its own video. That's how big a string, the string data type is. So we're going to talk about the string later. So remember the syntax about declaring a variable, right? So the syntax about declaring a variable. Also pay attention to what is this thing called comments. So comments is just me making a comment. So it's like me saying this is important. So when when I'm when I run this code, Java won't pay attention to this. This is just for the next person to read, or for me in case I forget. Because trust me, if you spend even like four months not looking at this code, you're not gonna remember what what you're doing here. So comments are very important. So I'm gonna do comments. So this is this is a single line comment. So single line, single line meaning it's in it's in one single line, and then multiple line 
it means that it's multiple lines, right? How, how do you do a multiple line comment? You just do it like this. So you, you do a forward, uh, forward slash, asterisk, and then asterisk, and then forward slash. Uh, yeah, forward slash, and then you can, there's many, and then you can put a space like this, and then everything that you write here, it's going to be taken as a comment or a note. It's just a note that you're making to yourself. Comments are just notes that you make to yourself or to for, for the other person who's going to use your, who's going to look at your code. And I, I'm sure you keep hearing me. I keep saying code, code, code. What is code? Anything that you write like this, all of these things, we call it code. Just a, any set of statements written in a programming language. We call that code. So I want to write a comment so that I explain the ranges of the data type. So byte, um, it's it stores eight bits. And bits, remember, just means binary digits, zeros and ones. So it stores eight bits and then short stores 16 bits. And then um, int stores 32 bits. And then long, long is just a type of an integer. It's a different version of an integer, but then it's 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 it's, a, it's like an integer, but it's lo it's a long integer, right? So but hence hence it's called long. It's still an integer, but it's a it's a long integer. So you can store more a bigger value or a bigger integer or a bigger whole number compared to the normal int data type. So this one stores 64, 64 bits or 64 binary digits. Bits stands for binary digits. And then we have float, which is um, stores 32 bits um, according to the I, it's called the IEEE standards uh, 754, I think. According to that standard, that's that, that's how many bits it stores. Java Java uses the IEEE 754 standard. I'm gonna I'm just gonna talk about it in simple terms. You can go do your research. So we also have double, which is gonna be 64 bits. I triple E 754. So what what is I triple E stands for just stands for the Institute of Electrical um, Electronics the Institute of Electro Electrical Electronics um, Engineers. I don't know. I don't know if it's it's and engineers engineers, but yeah, that's that's the standard that. Uh, Java follows. So um, this standard, it's it, it, it's basically the one that sets. It's the one. It, it it's the one that set the standards for representing floats in computers, right? How how floats or how how doubles are, are represented. Doubles um doubles of floats. We could these are this if you remember the number system. These are what we call irrational numbers. A float and a double is an irrational number. And then an integer or a long or a short or even a byte, that's what we call whole numbers. These are whole numbers. So just keep that in mind. Um, you can just go and Google the IEEE 754 standard. So, so let's, let's, create, let's create variables, right? So this stores eight bits, right? And then if you want to find the ranges, um, the range it's always going to be two, base two to the power of n, where n represents the number of bits. So it's going to find the range. You're going to say from negative two to the power of n two. Two to the power of 
to the power of n n minus one, right? So that's how you always gonna find the range. That's the formula. I'm using two because there's two binary digits, right? There's, you can only have two binary digits, zeros and ones. Some might ask, why am I why am I saying two to the power? Why am I doing that? If you remember your math, your math class, this is this is related. This is similar. Remember what I said about the computers trying to mimic our real world. Remember the way we calculate, we represent um, numbers in, in in our world on Earth. How do we represent numbers? We use the deck system, deck system, or decimal system, where deck means ten. So we use base ten basically to represent numbers. So what do I mean by that? So 123 is basically um, 10 to the power 2, 10 squared plus 10 to the power of 1 times 20 times 2, no, not, not times 20, times 2 plus 3 times 10 to the power of zero. If you add up these numbers, it gives you 122. You can see our base is base 10 because we have 10 numbers to represent the number system, right? To represent numbers. In computers, it has two digits to represent numbers. That's why I'm saying two to the power of. That's why I'm saying that. So if you calculate this, you're going to find out that this equals 100 plus 20 plus 3. Remember 10, any number to the power of 0 equal, equal, equates to 1. So it's going to be 1, 3 times 1, which is just 3. So now this becomes equals to 123. So it goes back. That's how number, that's how numbers are represented in, in our system, in our world. We use the deck system or the decimal system where deck means 10. So basically we use base 10. Our base is 10. So with computers, you know, we're saying base is 10 because we have 10 digits to represent the numbers. What are the 10 digits? It's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. These are the 10 digits that we use to represent any number. Some might ask, oh, what about 90? How do I represent 90? Remember, 90 is just the combination of 9 and 0. There's the 0 here. There's the 9 there. So I get 90. That's how I can represent 90. So every number that you can possibly think of is represented by these numbers, every number. So how many numbers are here? Let's count. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have ten numbers in our in our system. So that means I'm gonna use base ten. In computers, there's two numbers, zeros and ones. So I'm gonna use base two. So just keep that in mind. So this is where n uh, represents the number of bits. So n, n represents the number of bits. That's how you can find the range. So you're always going to start from negative 2 to the power of n, and then you stop at 2. Oh, um, it's, always two, it's always 2 minus 1, right? If I'm not mistaken, no. It's 2 to the power of n minus 1. So that final answer, you're going to subtract one. I think you also subtract one from. Yeah, you, su you also subtract one from the exponent, if I'm not mistaken. Let me do a quick calculation. Um, two to the power, where's my calculator? It has to be 128, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it has to be two to the power of seven, right? 
uh, two to the power. Okay, yeah, I think it's two to the power of seven. Two to the power n minus one. If I'm, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think it's, this is how it is. You subtract the exponent by one. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's gonna be like this. Let me calculate two. Yeah, it's two to the power of n minus one. Yeah, so is every that's how you're gonna find the range. This is the formula for finding the range. So it's two to the power of n minus one. And then to find the upper range, you subtract a one from the answer. So if you calculate this, you're gonna get the range of negative 128 to 127. Inclusive. So if I wanted what what what's the point of these ranges, you might ask. Because a byte is still an integer, a short is still an integer, an int is still an integer, a long is still an integer. Why do I have four different variations of integers? Well, it, it, you, you can you can think you can think of it in this way. Sometimes we we there's times whereby the data that we're trying to represent it has very big numbers, right? very big numbers, right? That's where a long comes in. But if the data that we are working with only represents a small range or a small integer, we use data types like byte, bytes and shorts. We can use a byte or a short. So for example, if I wanted to represent the age or to store the age of people, right? I can either use a byte or a short because there's no need for me to use an integer. Because an integer you can store a maximum of two point something billion. Why would I? What would I be wanting to represent with two billion? There's no one who's, who's two billion years old, right? So there's no need for me to use that data type. It's not applicable to to this scenario. I can, I'll most likely use a byte to store the age. So keep that in mind. Data types are applicable to to specific scenarios. If you're working with specific data, if it's based on the range, you must. that's why I'm giving you the formula for finding the range. So let's say I wanted to store the age and let's say the life, the average lifespan of a person, at most we can say it's 120 years, right? Therefore, I can use a byte data type to store the age. Because as you can see, I'm still within the bounds of the range of numbers that it can store. So let's create variables, right? So I'm gonna create it, call it a variable called age, and then I'm gonna create a variable here. And then what, what can I store here? Let me just say number. And then here I'm gonna say, let's just say phone number something like that and then here let's just say um let me see what can i store here what what was a very big number that i can store here even phone number you don't necessarily need an int but yeah along what what, what data can I represent with a long? Mm. Let me say, let me see. Let's just say net worth, right? Let's just say you want to store someone's net worth there. And then float, we can just say, mm, what float, let's just say price. I just want to store the price and then double. What could you want to store in a double? Let's just say you want to store an average. Something like that, right? So we can use these data types to store. We can use these labels or variables. We can use age to store the age. We can use the label to store num label number to store a number. 
this to store for number, this to store net net worth, this to store the price, this to store the average. So we can have all these different um, variables to store different data. So, so let's just run it. Let's test if everything is still fine before we do anything. So this is what we have so far. So let me run it. How would, how would you run it? That's the question. So you'd have to go to the folder and then type CMD, the folder that has the file that you're trying to run, right? And then go to the search bar and type CMD. And then I want to list. Um, okay, there's the file. Hello world to Java, right? Clear screen. And then now, how do how would I run the Java file? So I need to compile it, right? I need to translate it first to the language of the compute. Pay attention to the left panel, the left side. And see, you'll see that um, there's going to be a dot class file that that gets generated when I call the compiler. How do I compile the Java program? I'll say Java C. Java C stands for Java compiler. The C stands for compiler. And then space followed by the name of the file. So hello world dot Java is the name of my file. And then I press enter. There we go. There's the dot class file right here, right? What is the dot class file? It's the file with the binary language. So it's the it's the file with the language of the compute. You see how complicated this thing is? There's three over four, there's null, 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 SI, whatnot. Yeah, imagine all of this that I've written here. All of this. This is how it, this, this is how it would look in its own language. So you see why we couldn't write with they had to invent programming languages because we can't write in the language of the computer. It's very complicated. So you see, imagine trying to remember all of these things. It doesn't make any sense. So we have the 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 translated file, right? Now I run the translated file. I run it via what you call a JVM, a Java virtual machine. So I just use the keyword Java to run it. So I'm gonna say hello world, but I won't say dot class. So you don't put the dot class there. You see, it's gonna it's gonna give you an error. You don't put the dot class. You just run it without the extension. So you just say hello world. And then there we go. So we didn't have any errors, right? If we had errors and we didn't have any output, I didn't tell it to output something. So that's why there's no output. All I did was just create variables. As you can see, here are my variables. That's only what I did. So um, let's 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 make it crash, right? Let's create a, a problem. Let's say to, to put a full stop here or, the, or this semicolon, right? Remember, it's very strict. You have to tell it when you are done writing something. So you have to put a semicolon there. I didn't put it on purpose. Let's run it and see. So in order for it to have these updates, right, I would have to recompile it. So I would have to say Java C first, and then hello world dot Java, as you can see. Now it's giving me an error. It's saying error, semicolon, is expected. Where is it expected? If you go to this line, it's line 19. Line 19, you're going to find this code and it's expected here. Let's go. Let's see if, where there's where there's line 19. There's line 19 here. There's 19. It's expected here. So I put the semicolon there. If you can understand, if you pay attention to what it's saying, you can really understand and not having issues writing your programs. So hello world to Java. Let's run it again and see if there's going to be any errors. Boom, there's no errors, right? Because I I followed the rules that Java has. 
every every statement must be terminated with a semicolon. So I did follow the rules. So now let's say we want to display. So let's say we want to display the age, right? So there's this thing called. Um, so each variable has three three things, right? It has a, a data type, it has a name, and a value. So that's how that's those are the three things that a variable has. It has a data type. It is a name and a value. So it is three things. Every variable is three things: data type, name, and a value. So if you look at our data types, is they have no values, but they have our variables. I mean, they have data. They have a data type and they have a name, but there's no values. So let's give them values, right? So how would I store a value? You can do it in two ways. You can write it in one line like this. Or you can say, put it in the next line and say, let's say this person is 89 years old, right? Like this. You can do that. You see, this is two lines. But then there's no point in doing that. You can do it in one line like this, put a space, and then say it's equals to 89. So we have this 89, and then number here, let me say, I think a thousand should be fine. Phone number nine nine two something like this, just some number. And then net worth, let's say you're worth a billion, right? Um that's gonna be three six nine, right? Java also has this thing called uh, this nice feature for being able to read numbers well. As you can see, look at this billion. I can't really tell what number it is because there's so many zeros. It can it becomes very confusing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put underscores like this. You can put underscores. You see, now it becomes easier to read the number. I can see, oh, that's a billion. OK. And then um, price. Remember what is talked about float, float, a float and a double. It's an it's it's a let me say uh, it's not really an irrational number, it's a it's a rational number. Yeah, it's just a rational number. Any number that is a decimal or that there is a decimal point. So I can say nine point eight nine. That's a number, right? Average, let's say average mark was ninety-five. 0.5, something like this, five zero. So we have that. So we have these numbers, right? I think there might be an issue here. Let, let, let me see. Mm, yeah, there might be an issue, but let's run it. Let's let, let's run and see the issue. So I'm going to compile it again. Hello world dot Java. Exactly, there's an issue. So the issue here, it's saying, um, let's read it. Possible loss, lossy conversion, conversion from double to float. So what happens is that in Java, right, whenever you write a number like this, it automatically converts it. It automatically interprets it as a double. What's the difference between a float and a double? A double has double precision or double accuracy compared to a float. So with a float, you can have um, a float. You can have numbers from seven to eight digits, right? Those are those. That's the range that you can have. The numbers after the the number the numbers after the the dot. You can have seven to eight, and then. With the float, um, with the double, I mean, it is double precision. So you have 15 to, I think 15 to 17, so many digits that you can that you can represent using a double. So it automatically, there's this. Um, if if you check the range, the range of the float and the range of the double, 
the double somewhat is a double it is a double accuracy compared to float that's why this is called the double because it's double it is double accuracy compared to compared to a float so a float is usually referred to as single precision right and then a double is usually referred to as double precision so it is twice the precision so yeah that's the float and then as i was saying the problem with this is it automatically converts to a double right so i'm trying to store a double in and i've told you that i'm i'm gonna store a float and then in your mind you might be like okay but it, isn't it one and the same thing i mean this dot it's it's a it's a rational number this is also a rational number so shouldn't it interpret them as the same no it can't remember the ranges are not the same look at the range this one can represent um um six, 64 bits 64 binary digits you can calculate by saying 2 to the power of 63 minus 1 that's the maximum that you can the number that's the maximum number that it can be represented right and then this one is uh, it can represent represent 32 bits that means the number the number of digits that it can represent it's 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 half the size of this if it's half that means i'm trying to store something very big into something that can only accommodate half of this so it becomes an, a problem so what's happening here in this scenario in this one line of code is this concept called narrowing So narrowing. So I'm narrowing down. So it's this is called called wide. There's there's two topics. There's two uh, things that you need to be aware of. There's the na narrowing and widening concept, right? Narrowing it means that you're taking a data type of a of a longer range and re and reducing it to and storing it into a variable of a data type of a shorter range. So what do I mean by that? Look at it. Okay, let's not pay attention to the actual number and the values. Let's just look at the bits, right? This one can represent 32 bits, right? 32 binary digits, right? And short can only store 16, right? So you can see the problem, right? If I'm if I take an integer and I store it into a variable of type short. It's gonna have an issue because short can only accommodate 50% of the digits that are stored here, only 50%. So that's why they're calling it narrowing it down because you are narrowing it down. You are reducing, you are reducing its length or its size. So that's narrowing down. So just keep that in mind. That's narrowing down. So we have this narrowing down right so let's let's make an example let me let me separate it let's make an example narrowing down what would what would narrowing down mean it means that i take remember this can only represent eight bits right so this is me saying age and i want to store a very big number net worth there's net worth right this line should give me an error this value is way too big than what we can accommodate. We can only accommodate a maximum of 102, an, integer, an integer up to 127. That's the maximum I can accommodate. And I'm trying to store a billion. You see, you see what the problem is. So I'm narrowing it down. So let's see what happens if I try to narrow it down. It should give me an error. So I'm going to say Java C, hello, world, dot Java, right? I'm, I'm going to compile. There we go. It's going to give me an error because I'm trying to narrow it down. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, possible lossy conversion. It means that you might lose some values. And it's, it's okay, I'm still complaining there because we haven't fixed that line. So it means you can lose some values 
because the thing on the left, it can only accommodate an integer up to 127. And I'm trying to say a billion. That's way too big than what I than what I can accommodate. Or than what I can store or what age the age label can store. So how do we fix this? There's this thing called type casting. So if you are you only do type casting only if you are narrowing. Because because what what type casting in a way it call, it's what you call explicit casting. It's a direct casting. You are directly casting telling it okay. I don't care that I'm going to I don't care that the fact about the fact that I'm going to lose some digits. I do not care. Just do the dem just perform the dem task. Store the number. I don't care whatever value I'm going to I'm going to lose. So how do we do that? In front of the variable, you put brackets like this and then you put the data it, this data type of what's on the left. What is the data type of this? It's a byte. So I'm going to cast it to a byte. So now it's going to be reduced to what a byte can store and then it stores it into a byte in, into this um, into the age variable that is of type byte. And then we're going to compile it again. You see there were two errors, right? This error was fixed. This one is not fixed yet. With this one, right, there's two ways you can fix it. With floats, right, there's two ways you can fix it. Um, OK, with the also with the long, you need to. There's also a way to represent longs. So with the float, Right with the float, you need to put a suffix f there. It can be a small letter f or an upper letter f. Lowercase or uppercase f. Then it knows, oh, okay, you mean a float. So it's going to convert it automatically. In, yeah, you don't convert it necessarily. It's going, to be, it's going to represent a float. So now I'm storing a float. Then it's like, oh, okay, no problem. I won't, I won't be moaning at you anymore. This is going to be a float. So let's compile it again. There we go. No errors. So you need to be aware. Every time you create a float, you need to add the suffix f at the end to denote that this is a float. It's not a double. Remember, automatically, if I leave it like this, it's going to assume it's a double. And now you see the problem. We get the problem, the narrowing problem. If I if I leave it here as a double, because the double is way too big for, for a float range. The float range is only 32 bits. The double is twice the range of the float. So now I have to narrow it down. It's either I narrow it down or I put the suffix F to say, OK, this, this is a float. So don't create 64 bits of containers. Only create 62 bits of containers to store the value. Also with the long, you must always add a suffix L there. But we don't we don't add the small, you can add small uh, L or you can add a lowercase L or an uppercase L. We don't use the lowercase because the lowercase can be mistaken for one. You see, you think it's a one. So we always use a an uppercase L like this. Here it automatic. You see here, you might ask yourself, why didn't it have a problem here? Why didn't it complain about me not putting an L there? Because what happens is that it's going to look at this integer and see, is it large enough to be stored inside an integer? No. Then it's going to be automatic automatically casted to a data type that's big enough. That's bigger than an integer. What's bigger than an integer? It's a long. So I didn't have to put the L there, but if it's a small number like a 10, I have to put the L at the end to say, OK, this is a long. Remember, this is a long. So don't save it as a as an integer. Save it as a long. It's a very long integer. It's a very big integer. So. Yeah, if I run this again, it's just, you see it's fine. Even if I leave it like this, it's still going to be fine. Let's compile it. You see, it's still going to be fine. 
Because why is it why is this fine? Because it's 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 now widening. This is now what we call widening. I'm taking something from a small range and storing it into into a container of a wider range. So I'm widening. So what's what's the small range? The small range is the phone number, right? So let, let's, let's just do this. Let's say net worth, right? Is equals to phone number. So this one on the side is an integer. And then this one on the left is a long. So I'm trying to store this law, this integer into a long. Remember, an integer is smaller than a long, so I am widening the integer. This side, when it came here, it was a byte on the left and then an int on the right. So as you can see, the int is bigger than the byte. So I was narrowing. In simple, a simple term that I can use, we don't. It, it's not used. I'm just using it to make things simpler for you to understand. We can use, we can say shrinking. I was shrinking, I was shrinking or reducing or narrowing the size. So whenever you are narrowing, you have to explicitly cast. You have to convert. You have to make, you have to convert what's on the right to match the data type of what's on the left. What is on the left is a byte. So I have to cast this to a byte. So if I have 10 on this side, that means that 10 must be converted to a byte. So that's also casting. So with widening, it doesn't matter because the container that I'm trying to store it in, I'm trying to store it into this long and the int is, is half the size, so it's fine. Because I'm going to store it in the, into this long I'm going to store 50% of the 50% of the size of long. I'm going to store that integer. I'll still have face space. The other 50% will still have space. So I don't have to cast. It won't, it's not going to moan in me and be like, OK, yeah, this is a pen, a, a, a lossy conversion. What, what error? No, it's not going to give me that error. If you run it now, you'll see. There we go. There's no errors because this line is fine. I'm widening the range because phone number on the left is what? It's an integer. What is the data type of the one on the on the on the left? It's a long. So obviously, long is longer than an integer, or it's wider than an integer. So therefore, it can accommodate. I have enough space, more than enough. But then here. I had I, I, I didn't have enough space, so I had to shrink it. That's what casting is doing. I'm narrowing it down. I'm shrinking it to be to be able to fit. The container that I have on the left hand side or the size of the container that I have on the left hand side. So in terms of shrinking right or narrowing, you can read like this. Imagine I only have one liter, right? And I'm trying to pour from two liters. See, I want to, I'm, pour, I'm pouring from the two liter bottle into the one liter bottle. So obviously, as you can see, I have to narrow it down. I'm shrinking this. And when, when since I'm shrinking it, that means I can't pour everything. So how, how, how do I make sure I pour enough? I convert to be, I make it this one. So I basically convert it to one liter. Right, so now it means that I'm only going to take in a maximum of one liter, not two liters, because my container on the left hand side can accommodate only one liter. Then this one, we have vice versa. I have two liters on the side, and then I'm pouring one liter into the two liter. So it's fine. There's no issues here. The containers, the, there's, there's no issues here with the containers. The net worth is larger, it's twice as big. And this one is smaller, it's half the size of this, so it, it's fine. So one liter can indeed fit into two liters. But the whole two liters can't fit into one liter. I have to shrink it. That's the whole concept of converting. That's what we mean by converting. So we have discussed a lot 
we've discussed a lot. So, yeah, we have the numbers here. So, we did cast and do all of that. So, this is what we call casting, right? Casting is just a fancy name for converting. So, casting we just, it just means we're converting. So um, I think I think now that's that's that should be enough information on data types. Maybe we just do a few exercises in the next video. Let's talk about a few things like just to perfect data types. But this is the numerical data types. These are all the numerical data types that you're gonna use, right? Oh, before I forget, this is very important concept or very important term that you need to understand. These are what we call primitive data types. Or in other words, primitive meaning that these are fundamental. These are fundamental data types. And then we're going to have um, other data type. What are, what are they called? But yeah, we're gonna have other data types. So it's like the other the other data types, right? It's very simple. It's like um it's gonna be a whole class for each date for each data type here. It's gonna be a it's gonna be called we call we call them wrapper classes like this. We call them wrapper classes, or I'll call them wrapper type, whatever you want to call it, but yeah. We'll we'll talk about those a bit later, but I don't want to feed you too much information in one video in one go. So these are the types that we have in Java. And then yeah, I think that should be it. Let me see. Yeah, I think that should be it. I don't want to make the video too long. So yeah, thanks for watching. I'm going to see you in the next lecture.